Well, we're nearing 1030, so we um, go ahead here pretty quick and have Fred uh, toss over to Fred and to do his business intelligence presentation. Yay, I get to be intelligent. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, you're wait. mad. <laughs> okay, I'll try and keep an eye on the chat window as well for uh, questions and stuff, but if I miss you... Um, when we get to the end, let me know and we'll fix it up. All right. So what we're going to go over is business intelligence, uh, assuming that I can get everything to work here. There we go. I can advance the screen now. Yeah, so not so much intelligent here. Um, I had to steal from, from Keho and Naoki. Yes, this is who we are since you can't see us. Okay. So what is business intelligence? You hear about it all the time. And it's actually using data to help improve your business and get it to people in a fashion that they can actually digest it. That lets you make more data-driven decisions. So instead of saying, well, normally it feels like we have a busy time around July, you can actually prove, hey, July, this is how many orders we get, and it extends into August for the first week or the first 13 days or something. This way you can make intelligent decisions as opposed to just driving your business off of feelings and things that you think might happen. Um, you could actually, as bad as it sounds, um, even take the data from events like today or like an earthquake or something and decide, hey, do we need to focus on certain areas of the world based on certain conditions that are happening? Um, for example, if you're in the medical industry and there's a hurricane that happens, maybe you need to gear up. Um, or if you see a tropical storm coming to an area, you might need to gear up production to help supply uh, those areas that are going to be in need. So you can make those intelligent decisions and try and be proactive about your business as opposed to reactive. Um, using, your, using the actual data, not your gut, to drive decisions. This can also include machine learning. Um, and what that is is basically having a computer look at your past data and your current data and predict trends or predict some sort of analysis that you might need uh, to be able to find like maybe you're on a five-year cycle, um, not implying that you make things that break down in five years, but maybe there's something, uh, a reusable part or a disposable part that, that breaks or is used up in five years. Maybe every five years you should go back to the customers that bought at that time period um, and go, hey, your item should be about used up. You should probably look at buying something additional to replace that uh, disposable part. So those are things that you can do with predictive analysis or machine learning. Now, in traditional business intelligence, um, which is what you've seen up until probably about the past two years, uh, maybe the past three years, IT, your your uh, technical staff would be developing reports based on questions that users, typically your C-level people or your VPs or that type of group, would have. Um, what are the things that sell good? What are what are our sales cycles actually looking like? Um, so what do we need to do to try and do this? The problems with that is that IT actually has to do changes to the report. And usually when you look at a business intelligence report, because you're being exposed to so much data, seeing something actually generates more questions. And so the trend lately has been towards going towards a self-service. So although I present a report to a user, um, they're able to interact with that report and drill in, drill out, modify that report on the fly so that they can answer their own questions. One, that takes a load off of IT. Two, it gives the user um, faster answers to their questions. So you don't have to sit there and wait to get into IT's queue, develop the report, get it back to you. Hopefully the data is correct because, you know, sometimes when you're filtering data, you may or may not uh, get the right data and it takes some analysis to validate that data. So now you're talking about a long turnaround time. You might miss a marketing opportunity or a sales opportunity because of that. Um, you may see that, hey, there's a conference coming up in Las Vegas. Should we attend it? Do we have people that are our customers who would actually be attending that, that uh, conference? 
if you can get that answer quickly based on certain demographics that you already have in your system, then you can make that decision whether you should attend that conference or not to even sell product. If it's not going to be worthwhile, why pay the fees? So that's kind of where things are going, and that's where you'll see a lot of what are called the more modern IT as opposed to, or modern business intelligence as opposed to the traditional business intelligence. So why do I want business intelligence? Um, what's the purpose behind this? And realistically, the biggest problem is data on its own is really hard to comprehend. As when you get a spreadsheet and it's 5, 20, maybe even 100 rows, big deal. If it's only 20 columns across, big deal. You can kind of look at it and you can figure out what's going on. When it gets to looking at five years worth of data down to your individual sales lines, you might be talking 5 million rows of information. Now you're getting harder to process. And that numerical or even alphabetical data can be difficult to process for a human. You're just, you're looking at it. You have to read each individual thing. You have to draw correlations between those items in your head and hold on to all that information. And if you're dealing with 5 million rows, that's a lot to hold on to your head. And humans realistically, scientifically, even we use pictures much better than we use text. So if you can draw a picture of something, that old phrase of pictures worth a thousand words, it's true. We're just, our brains are geared towards looking at images, not towards processing text. So if you can get a visualization and a visualization in business intelligence is like a graph, a chart, show me something so that I can draw a conclusion easier. And it may even be coloring the data or changing the size of something so that you can understand what's going on. In a visualization, you can actually send back to the user a lot of information in one picture as opposed to trying to describe it in words and making them uh, digest all that information row after row after row. And because it's easier to digest, you can make your conclusions faster. So it makes you more nimble in working with your business processes. So you can quickly adapt to different types of situations. The example of this that I use is if you look at a line chart, you can quickly see, hey, sales are going up or they're going down versus if you're looking at the day-to-day -day numbers, um, if you're looking at two months or three months worth of data, you're dealing with 90 rows of information and trying to find things out. And you may want to, when you look at that and you go, well, sales look like they're going up, but are they going up across all parts or they need to be anal analyzed by part group? Is there a group or a customer that's specifically doing more and more business? That's the type of questions that you're going to have. So you see that line graph and you go, hey, there's an uptick, but where's the uptick? Now you can drill in. Is it on a specific state, a specific customer? Um, Maybe Bob just had a good sales day and sold a whole bunch of igloos in Alaska. I don't know. Uh, those are the things that you can then drill in. And that's the purpose of business intelligence is to find out what that data is doing to you. Good use of this. Obviously, find a place where you can increase your profit. If you're making a lot of sales in a place, um, is there market share that you can get off of that? Or are you starting to saturate the market? If, even if your sales are going up, if you know there's a capacity that the market can hold and you're getting close to hitting that, maybe you need to look at what else you sell. Are there, are there partner components you could do or are there other areas of business you need to get in because pretty soon everybody's going to own Widget X. And once you own Widget X, you don't need another Widget X for five or 10 years. So if you saturate the market, although your sales are going up, pretty soon they're gonna all at once drop off. So if you can do those types of predictions, uh, you'll be able, again, to adjust your business accordingly so that you're not spiking, uh, dealing with the peaks and valleys of business. You can actually run a consistent business or better yet, a consistently upward swinging business so that you're always generating profit and increasing your profits. It does also let you analyze your behaviors, not only of your customers, but of your own staff. Um, business intelligence isn't just what you're selling and what people are buying. You can also use this for how are we producing things? Are we getting more efficient? Are we making better use of the materials that we have? Are we recycling scrap? Um, do we have scrap that we could sell to somebody else? Those types of things you can look at and figure out, are you making overall profit, not just profit in sales? Um, do we need more employee training because there's an increase in accidents on the shop floor? What do we need to do so that we're not hurting our people? You know, be proactive about those types of things. Maybe you brought in a new machine 
um, and somebody's always leaving door X open, and that creates a problem, uh, whether that's for the machine or the employee, either one. Um, but you can find those types of trends and behaviors, not just of your buyers um, and what you're selling, but also of people who are working with you, meaning your your employees on the shop floor. So you can do that to help them out, help the business out growing overall. Obviously, optimizing, predicting, and spotting trends. Where do we need to focus our efforts? And those efforts aren't just in sales. Maybe they're efforts in safety. Maybe they're efforts in, um, hey, all the machines that we bought it, uh, 15 years ago, we're starting to see that those are breaking down more and more often. Do we need to do some maintenance on them? Do we need to replace them? What are these trends that we can see? Again, it's very easy to get caught up in that. What is the trend we see in sales? But really, business intelligence is your entire business. You should be looking at everything. Well, I know you have to kind of start at one point and spread, but don't be afraid to look at other areas of your business, not just the sales, even though that's probably the point that you're going to start at because it's the one that everybody assumes is the first thing to look at. Um, if you're working with machines that are tied into capturing data, IIoT, you could spot trends with those machines because they're giving you data back. So figure out, do we need to do maintenance on them more frequently? Are they starting to fail more often? Um, as bad as it sounds, if Bob's the person that runs the machine, boy, production goes really good. When Bill runs it, it, production just tanks, but it's the same machine. What's the difference? Well, we can find out the difference. What's Bob doing that Bill's not? Maybe Bob needs to help Bill out. So the Bill learns, oh, if I use the machine this way, I can get more production through. So those are types of things that you can do, discovering those problems that you could have. Uh, just in your business in general, um, where you can have them on the shop floor, in sales, anywhere, shipping. You can even find out problems in shipping that certain products take longer to package up. And that should be obvious if you're working on the shipping floor that you would know that. But sometimes that information doesn't necessarily go up to the people who are doing planning to understand, hey, if we've got this type of order, it's going to take more time to, to package up to get on the truck. So it's not going to go out as fast as widget X, which, you know, we just throw in a box and shove it into a bin. So these types of things can help you figure out how to run your business more efficiently. So before we get into some things, um, there's a lot of confusion over what are some of these terms and a lot of what business intelligence is. People don't deal with day to day. So I kind of want to help out with what are these types of things that we're talking about. So in business intelligence, you're getting data from a data source. So where do you get your data? And it can be anything from a spreadsheet in Excel. It can be a SQL database, your mainframe. Uh, you can pull it from Salesforce. You can pull it from a website, NASDAQ, any of these things uh, can be a data source. And depending on what you're looking for, you might combine information from these various data sources so that you can get a bigger picture of what's going on. Just having the information from your own Epicor database uh, may not give you the whole picture of what's going on. You might need to tie into Salesforce. Um, if you're a seasonal or weather-based component, you might need to tie into weather.com to figure out, oh, if it's sunny and warm, more people are out at the retail stores, so they'll actually buy more of our products. We need to look at what is happening with the weather. Or again, maybe if a hurricane's coming, people buy more or less depending on what they're gearing up for. They might need to hunker down. They might need to uh, go out and actually uh, maybe they're evacuating an area in the case of a hurricane. Sorry to be the downer on this. I really need to find a better example. Um, Another term that we often find is ETL, which stands for Extract, Transform, and Load. Um, and what you're doing there is you'll take data from a data source, which is the extract part of it, and you might manipulate that data, and that's the transform. So, for example, I might need to, uh, Salesforce has a shipping code for UPS Ground that's UPS 1. Epicor has a shipping code for UPS Ground, and it's called UPS 01. Um, we might have UPS that actually has UPS ground and they call it UPS G. So being able to, when you pull that data out of those various sources, you want to get on a common code system, just like you want to have a common unit of measure inside of Epicor. Uh, you want to have a common code system for these types of things inside of your database. So that when you go to analyze, you're not having to write something that says, oh, if my data source is Salesforce, use UPS 01. If it's from UPS, use UPS G. And then you're writing more and more complex queries. 
you want to transform that data so it makes it easier to understand and people don't necessarily have to think to process all that information as much. And then of course the load is getting it into your common repository. So that way you've got a common area where you can actually query all this data that you've pulled from various places into one spot. So you'll also find the term warehouse. And if you look at the example here, we've got information coming in from Salesforce, Epicor, and Worldship. And again, they all have their own individual codes for that UPS ground. When it feeds into the warehouse where we're storing all that information, that repository, we just put it in as UPS ground. And that's what we're going to query on is what are all the shipments that have come by UPS ground, for example. So this way, your warehouse becomes kind of your place where you query information. That's where all the data is scrubbed. That's where it's all looking similar to each other so that you can write queries that actually make sense across all of these different data sources that you might have. Now, often when we're working with data, we need to normalize that data. And that's a term that's often used in, in databases. And people are like, well, what's normalize mean? Normalize, you're going to take out duplicates of information. So for example, if I've got an address I might store the address as rows of information, and then on my customer, um, I might have a pointer to that address location table. That way, I don't have to duplicate over and over and over. In the example here, um, I've got a whole bunch of people that are in the USA. So instead of have storing USA over and over and over in my rows, I can actually store that uh, I've got a country table, and I just have a pointer to that country table. The advantage here is that when I go to query my data, I can say, what are all the items that are in the USA? And it becomes a faster lookup. What are all the items that are in the state of Illinois or that are within this zip code? And so then I can actually find out information more quickly and more easily. Um, and Simon points out, government and industry data sources are useful uh, for adding and building approvals with your sales by territory. So if you've got sales by territory, you can look at uh, government uh, types of data sources that they regularly publish. You can also look at um, the other common example for normalizing data is dates. So where I might store January 2nd of 2020, I might have a table that actually has, okay, my date is January 2nd of 2020. Part of that date is the month. It's the first, the day, the year, what day of the week of it, what quarter is it? And again, this this way I've got all that information in a table so that I can quickly look it up. Yes, I could write functions that say, hey, if the month is equal to one, if the day is equal to two, do this and this. But those extra functions are going to take more time when I run my queries. If I've got it all in a table like this, maybe I wanna analyze what are all the things that happen in quarter one and then break that down year by year. So now I can just go back and quickly look those pieces of information up because they're tied to those other records. So instead of having to break that down with all these functions by having tables that do this, meaning normalize your data, uh, it's easier to do those lookups and get that analysis done. Here's an example of what extract, transform, and load kind of looks like. So you've got your different sources of information, could be a flat file, your ERP system, Salesforce up there. You send it through your extract, transform, and load, put it into your data warehouse, and then you'll use that warehouse for your analytics, your reporting, and your data mining. And data mining um, is kind of a term when you use that to actually drill into your data. Uh, you might have an AI engine that sits there and actually mines the data to look for trends. So analytics is more like a human's looking at it to try and find the information. Mining, they typically say you're doing some sort of machine learning or machine-driven analysis to that. So then the other term that you'll often hear, I mean, we've kind of grown up with warehouses for a while. We've got data cubes out there. What is a cube? Well, basically we're gonna take that information in that warehouse and we're going to run some consolidations and pre-calculations on it so that we can get better query performance. So for example, if I know I'm going to query my sales and I wanna be able to run that for years, for months, for days, for days of the week, for quarters, um, based on weather, I can pre-slice that information so that it's sitting there ready to be queried, and that's going to speed up my reporting. This way I don't have to run those queries to pull the data back. I'm basically 
pre-slicing that information or pre-running any calculations that I need so that I can improve my, my report performances, get information back faster. Now cubes you'll typically hear are done in dimensions and measures. And the easiest way that I've gotten people to, th to think of what is a dimension versus what, a, what is a measure, measure are basically numbers. What's a quantity sold? What's the price on something? What are the days to ship? How fast did we get this out the door? Numerical information is basically your measure. Things that you can sum, average, find your min, find your max, those types of things. Dimensions are how you want to analyze the information. I want to analyze it by what sold in January in the past five years, or what sold in quarter one over the past four years, what sold in Iowa versus Illinois, product categories, industries that you're selling into, those types of things. That's how you want to slice up your data to do the analysis and figure out what's going where. Now, when you're working with cubes, it's not uncommon, in fact, it's very common, to have multiple cubes. You might have a cube that analyzes sales information. You'll have a separate cube that analyzes shipping information. You might have a separate cube that analyzes shop floor uh, performance. So because you're looking at different information, you might have different cubes because you're going to have different questions. So you might hit different cubes to get this information back out. That's not uncommon. Don't be afraid to when your data team says, hey, we might need another cube for this. Yes, if you can get it all in the same cube, awesome. But it's a lot easier sometimes to break this up because the questions that you're asking are just too different uh, to try and get both your sales information and your um, shop floor information into the same cube. It might not work. So don't be afraid to see multiple cubes there. An example of a cube here, um, on the back, we've broken things up by quarters and we can get a sum of what happened in a quarter for our various product lines. So we've got a product line called TV, PC, VCR, and then all three of those products put together is that front kind of plane that we're talking on. And then we've got kind of rows of information based on the country that things are working in. So India, Nepal, China, and then again, we've got that, that bottom row or bottom plane that tells us the sum of information across all of those countries. So cubes are just how do I want to organize that information? Now, visually, again, because we're humans, we process things, we can handle things up to three dimensions. That's why this example works well here. But it's not uncommon for a data cube to actually have more than three dimensions. It'll go into four, six, whatever, based on how much slicing you want to do. Um, maybe you need not only the product, uh, but you also want uh, where it came from. Maybe you're drop shipping from multiple locations and you want to have that in here. So that might be a fourth dimension on this. So although we represent things as cubes, uh, it's kind of because in the space that we work with as humans, we can understand a cube, but we can't understand what's something that goes into four or five or six dimensions. But you can end up with data cubes that are actually more dimensions than just three. It all depends on what you're analyzing and how you want that analysis to go. So OLAP is just the uh, online analytical processing, I think is what OLAP stands for. And it's just basically, how do we do analysis of our cube information? This is just another example, how we pull information from our relational database. We may be joining our product and our supplier and our categories together, but then when we shove it into the cube, each cell we don't need to query these individual tables anymore because the cell holds the information that we need. And then we can just query based on what we're slicing by, the category, the time dimension that we've got, and maybe where we're shipping to, for example. So those tell us the individual cells within that cube where we wanna pull the information out of. And that's just getting our information back quicker and allows us to do kind of broader analysis of things faster. Data mining, I kind of already went over, again, using databases and machine learning to uncover trends. So when you're dealing with these large data sets, um, if you're dealing with 5 million rows, more than that, or some of you have been business long enough and you might even have the data for it, if you're analyzing 50 years worth of data and you want to find trends over time, that's a lot of data to go through. So sometimes that's easier to deal with, uh, have a machine that's actually not a machine, but a computer run some analysis for you to help identify those trends that as a human, you may just not see. 
uh, because some small ticker over here actually triggers a big event on another table, you might not see that because you're looking at large swings of movement, not necessarily looking for a small swing over here creates a large swing in another table. That's where AI might actually help you out. Now, the, I believe the last term we've got, and this is a more modern term, is a data lake. So we've kind of gone from a data warehouse and cubes um, into data lakes. And what data lakes are, are basically a way where we can store not only our structured data, meaning we've organized things by dates and locations and things like that, but you might have unstructured data. You might have a feed from Facebook and based on certain words that people post back to your Facebook might indicate a swing in sales or something. Um, how people are reviewing you on Yelp might create uh, indicators as far as how your business is going. So getting that unstructured data, combining it with your structured data and doing that analysis and predictive performance gets you your data lake. So basically a lake is, as bad as it sounds, any river of information that you can have pumping into the lake, doesn't matter whether it came from your ERP system, Facebook, Yelp, Weather Channel, any of these things uh, can all feed into that data lake. And you're not going to have any real structure in that. Uh, as your data comes in, your users are going to query it. And they might say, hey, in the Facebook stream, look for words um, best, greatest, worst and then analyze sales against that. So we'll look at when that was written onto Facebook, look at our sales within a two week period of that time, how did that trend go? So that may be some analysis that you'd be doing. Yes, that's kind of out there, but depending on what you're doing with your business and how it's exposed on different forms of media, um, how it's getting reviewed, maybe there's a news uh, review of you, you ended up on national news instead of local news, you might see different uh, information that affects your sales and such. So based on all those terms, what are tools that we can use to actually do business intelligence? And yes, you can use Excel to do business intelligence. There's nothing wrong with that. Excel, you can pull in all that information. You could run a pivot table. You can get charts of information from Excel. Um, accountants do this all the time to show you, hey, here's where the numbers are going over the past five years. Nothing wrong with that. It is a tool and it is a business intelligence tool when used correctly. But sometimes getting that data in there and figuring it out and writing the pivot can become cumbersome, especially when you go to try and distribute that information and become, can become very cumbersome. So although Excel is used and has been used quite a bit in the past, um, it may not be the perfect tool for you. But if you're dipping your toe into business intelligence and what that is, it might be the great tool uh, to get you started so you can figure out what types of questions are you going to ask because you do need to understand what do I want out of my business intelligence. It, I mean it's great to just build this repository of information but if you don't have a question that you're looking to solve what is it? Um, it's just data that's sitting out there and has to be maintained. If you've got questions that you want answered now you can do some direction and by asking those questions seeing the answers that's probably going to drive more questions and you can further refine what your business intelligence solution is doing we also have epicor executive dashboards and i'll show you an example of that um, epicor data discover i obviously missed the why on that i'll have to update that but epicor data discovery is a form of business intelligence they're using baqs to analyze information give you graphs of information so you can see things over time based on product groups, so on and so forth. A very traditional tool uh, that's been around for quite a while is SQL. Uh, so we've got the SQL tools, meaning SQL database engine, SSIS, which is integration services, SSAS, which is your analysis services for cubes, and SSRS, which is the reporting services. Um, IS, the, the integration services, would be your extract, transform, and load tool. We also have Epicor Data Analytics from Focus Software, a really good business intelligence tool that's pretty much modern, and Power BI, and I'll show you Power BI a little bit. Uh, I've got screenshots of a couple things from Epicor, or Epicor Focus, nah, Epicor Data Analytics from Focus Software. I've got a couple screenshots so you can see the types of things that you can do in Focus as well. So Excel, easy to pull information together, easy to do pivots. If you're good at it, you can do VLOOKUPs to uh, get correlations of information. 
So it's an easy tool. It's a low cost tool. If you already got Microsoft Office, it's already in that suite. If you're on Office 365, it's in there. So it makes it an easy tool to adopt because of cost. Very easy to get into and start doing some things. With Epicor REST, you can pull in BAQ information into uh, or in from Epicor into Excel. So you could write a BAQ to get your data, pull it into Excel. You can also do direct SQL queries from Excel against the SQL database and pull that into Epicor or into Excel as well. So easy to get this information put together and then do your analysis. The cost actually comes when you're trying to do those reports. Having somebody that understands the data and understands Excel to put that together, uh, they're not the, it's not the easiest tool to quickly write a report um, and put a graph together that's putting a whole bunch of different information into the same spot. So if you're querying sales and you're trying to query um, shipments and trying to query XYZ, correlate all that together and then come out with some sort of visualization, that's going to take you a little bit. So although Excel is a tool you can use, when you start getting into more sophisticated things, it may not be the best choice of tool. Epicor Executive Dashboards. Um, if you've got the Shop Visual Module, they're in there for you. A couple things with the Executive Dashboards. You do have to schedule cube processing. So what dashboards do is basically there's a set of BAQs that run and get the information and then they slice, they pre-slice the information and get it all ready for you so that you can run your dashboard against that cube of information. So you have to schedule those BAQs to run on the frequency that you're going to want to query the data so that you've got that there. Um, these are a little, I had a struggle to create them, so <laughs> let's put it that way. Um, they're not the most intuitive things to create, but again, if you've got some experience, it's something you can do. You do end up creating a BAQ to get information, and then you have to create an executive BAQ that runs against that BAQ that you first created to get your cube information. Um, and then you'll create a BAQ to query that executive BAQ or executive query that you created so that you can fill in your dashboard. You'll end up creating process sets so that those can be scheduled to run to do all that processing of the BAQ, create the cube and populate the information. So an example of this, just to show you what it looks like, um, I'll try and switch over here. There we go. So if I go to the main menu for Epicor, go to executive analysis, shop vision, and just bring up sales backlog analysis. And hopefully this opens up on the same page. Give it a second. No, it didn't. So I'll swing that over here onto my window. And then I'll hit the refresh button just like you would with a normal dashboard. So this gives you a little bit of a graphic. You can hover over things and they highlight and gives you your data. I can switch what dimension I'm looking at from country to customer group and it switches over here and I can drill in what's my automotive, what's my construction agency doing. I can look at specific customers and you'll see that the rows over here change accordingly. So you've got some information and some uh, reports back that you can drill or you can slice the information as you're working with it. Because it's from Epicor, you're keeping your data up to date as long as that process sets running. So you're always going to have accurate data or mo maybe not real-time data, but near-time data uh, based on when those processes run to fill this in. Now, my problem with this is um, it's not necessarily the most pretty thing to look at. And you see, as we kind of scroll around, it's I've got my wheel chart and that's about it. And then to modify that, I'd have to go in and actually modify the dashboard. If I want to modify the query, I've got to go back and talk to IT unless I'm really good with BAQs. So it's not the best tool if you're looking to build something new. If you if one of the existing executive dashboards works for you and you get the information that you're looking for, great, run with it. Because uh, it's pre-built and you'll get it. You just have to buy the module and you're off and rocking. So that's kind of a nice thing. Flip back over here. Um, so Epic dashboards are built into Epicor. Like I said, not the best display. And as far as setting them up, um, Bless your heart if you can do them. They're just not the most intuitive thing to do, even if you're familiar with BAQs, just because you have to have multiple levels of BAQs that tie together. So if you end up breaking uh, a low-level BAQ that's getting your root information, uh, it can be difficult to 
that that problem will actually uh, go into your executive queries and the queries that you're doing on your dashboard. So you have to be very careful about what you're doing with your queries when you modify them. And it is a module purchase from Epicore, so you do need to talk to your CAM as far as the cost. I actually have no idea what the cost is for that module. And there's an example, again, of what the dashboards look like. So Epicore data discovery, easy to work with. If you can build a BAQ, you can build an Epicore data discovery tile. It all starts with a BAQ, and then you just go in and manipulate the tile to say, how do you want this data to show? Do you want it as a grid? Do you want it as... A line chart do you want it as a circle chart and even when you've got that tile built you can quickly replicate that tile and say I don't want a circle chart or a, a circle graph anymore I want a bar chart and then show me the average as well or take that same BAQ and now show me uh, a key indicator KPI uh, show me the sum of the information broken down by product group for example so it's easy to manipulate those tiles and get different views of your information. The cost of entry, hey, it's free. It came with Epicor. So as long as you've got um, a more modern version of Epicor, I think that started in 10 to 200. I could be wrong, forgive me if I am. Um, you've, got, you've got EDD built in. So you can start working with that tool and you can start getting some information. Really nice thing about EDD, you can put it up on the active homepage. So if you've got higher ups, managers, VPs, C-level people that are looking for some analysis of that Epicor data, you can put it on the homepage so it's right there when they log in. So it's easy to access and you can combine multiple tiles together to get a holistic view of what's going on. Maybe you need to see sales versus shipments versus um, quantity produced on the shop floor. You could have three different tiles that are all showing that information. So that's really nice. An example of doing those multiple tiles is, of course, the layouts that they give you by default, and you can create your own layouts. So the finance layout, um, we can show days past due uh, with customers who have overdue invoices. And then you can drill in and go, okay, well, what customer is that in that bar? And now I know as a finance person, who do I need to go talk to to get money from? Who is who is it that owes us the most, or who is it that has the the oldest invoice. There's also a tile for past due balance. Who owes us the most money? So maybe you want to look at those two graphs together, find the person that actually owes you the most money for the longest period and go after them uh, to get money back into the company. And I think I've got an example of that here. And I'm going to try on my home page. Um, if I switch, I didn't log in as the right person. Let me try and log in as Epicor. Epicor, I believe, is the default, and I can get to my finance layout. All right, and we just got to wait for everything to refresh here. I should have preloaded this. I apologize. It's pulling up the information here. Oh, and of course, I'm going to get access tonight. You ever have one of those days? Anytime you try to do a live demo, right? There we go. I'll just individually refresh these two guys. So I can hover over the information and you'll see it tells me what customer has the problem and how many days overdue they are. I can also hover over my past due balance and find out the customers that are having a problem. And if I want to, I can expand this and go into Epicor Data Discovery full blown. And then I can manipulate based on the filters and things. I can decide what I want to do with this data information. Now, EDD is hitting live information. So this is real time. So as things are changing inside of your upper core system, things are changing inside of EDD for you as well because they're using BAQs. So very easy to get real information, real time stuff, and do with it as you need to. I'm going to go back to my home. There we go. And we'll minimize this. And then I was just showing an example of EDD there. Now, SQL is, again, another tool that you can use. Like I said, SSIS, the ETL, AS is your cube information, RS is your reporting services. If you already own SQL, which if you're on Epicor 10, you do, you already have all of these parts. They come as one big package. If you own SQL, you've got the database engine and integration services, analysis services, and reporting services all there. So 
you can put this together. The downside of this, it can be daunting to put that information into cubes. If you're not sure of what you're doing, it can, it can be confusing to figure out how to slice and dice the information based on what you're putting together. Usually this takes somebody that has some SQL background to be able to help you put the cube together so that it's there and correct um, and create those hierarchies. I want to drill in on my dates. I want to be able to show a year and from the year I want to show uh, the half of the year, then the quarter of the year, then the month, then the, uh, I think they call it decand, which is the set of 10 days within the month and then the day of the month. Maybe I want to drill into the week, show me what happens on Wednesdays, show me what happens on holidays, those types of things. So it can get a little bit daunting to build that type of information. Once you've got it built up, it's easy to use, but getting it there the first time can be difficult. Um, a nice part, if you're working with Excel and you've got a cube, you can actually query that cube inside of Excel and those hierarchies that you get to be able to drill into your days or drill into um, your locations. Maybe you've got country versus state versus city versus zip code. Um, those hierarchies that you build for the cube, Excel actually understands. So when you query the cube inside of Excel, you're gonna get those drill ins automatically inside of Excel, which is really, really nice. Just to give you an example of what you end up doing uh, when you're kind of putting your cube together, you have to draw these relationships between the different tables and say, how are they related? What are your keys so that you can get the information? Um, transform it into the cube. So you've kind of got your warehouse. How are things related? And then you pull that out into your cube. What are the questions that you're wanting to ask? And then you can do these calculated fields like you see over here what are my calendar year, my month, my day of month, you'll get those figured out because the cube's going to process that so that it's a cell to actually query as opposed to running a mathematical function to figure out, oh, it's the first quarter of the year based on that date. And then you'll figure out your dimensions. How are you slicing things? So SS SQL as a solution, is a good solution. It can just get daunting to put it together and it does take a little bit of time to put it together. Now, another solution that uh, you can go out and purchase is Epicor Data Analytics or EDA from Focus Software. And it's a web-based tool. It takes your Epicor data and on a regular schedule, it will pull, you tell it what data you actually want to put up into uh, the Epicor Data Analytics Cloud. It is also available on-prem. Uh, their preference is to go cloud, but if you do have reasons, uh, it is deployable to, as an on-prem solution, so your data wouldn't go up in the cloud. Um, but it's easy to go into that tool and say, hey, I added a UD field to customer, and I want that to go into my analytics so that I can start doing analysis based on that UD field. You just go into that tool that interfaces with the cloud, and you say, include that field into my output. The next time it runs, it'll go and create that in the cloud. It'll pull all that information in for your past records. You're off and rocking. So kind of easy to work with. Um, Focus has the capability not uh, to inter... Let me try that again. Focus has the capability to interface not only with Epicor, but they can also interface with other data sources as well, like Salesforce, Excel, some others. So what you can do then, and they actually have a database uh, tool, you can draw relations between your Epicor ERP data and your Salesforce data, for example. So you could tie what's coming in from Salesforce, tie that to an order inside of Epicor. How do we get those two things to relate? So now you've got a more full picture of your data as opposed to just analyzing only your Epicor data. The UI is very easy to work with. Um, if you've looked at EDD, EDA is very similar. Um, they're not the same tool, they're not produced by the same people, but they are similar in functionality. So it's kind of a an intuitive interface. If you worked with one, you can work with the other one. And it's easy to customize your output. It's very easy to drill into data and drill back out. Um, and because it's web, they went with the attitude when they were building it that you can display anywhere. You can look at information on your phone. You can look at it in a web browser. You can look at it on a tablet. They're working with that so that it's always available to you. So you don't have to worry about things. Um, and I've got an inf information from Simon that says Focus Sync is a very handy utility. 
So the analytics, uh, what goes into this, um, basically focuses kind of three parts. You've got your analysis, which is how do I slice my data? Uh, that's what they're showing here over on the left. I'm in this center image over here. On the left-hand side uh, are the things that I'm going to slice or filter by. So that gets me my analysis. I can then visualize that information based on various graphs, charts, whatever I need. Um, they even do US maps, or I shouldn't say US maps, they do world maps. So if you wanna show uh, where did shipments go to on a map? Where are we shipping most heavily to? Maybe that can get you, hey, I need to negotiate with a different carrier. Uh, most of our stuff is staying within our state. Maybe if we got a truck, we could do our own delivery and save some money. That's the type of things that you can find out from the analysis and visualizations that you get with business intelligence. And then the third part of their tool is database designer. And that's what lets you um, manipulate the data in the cloud. So if you need to draw relationships, like I said, between the, the Epicor bits of data and let's say uh, Salesforce CRM, you can do that by combining that information inside the database designer. Once you've got it set up, it's then available inside the analysis and your visualization. So you, you don't have to keep setting it up every time you import data. Uh, that, that import just runs on a regular schedule. You go into the database designer to set up your relationships and they're set. So unless you need to change them, you kind of you really don't have to come back into them. And this is a bigger uh, image of that visualization so you can get a better look at the types of graphs and things that they do. And here's one that shows like a heat map um, on sales by territory over in the bottom left there. Okay, and the last tool that I wanna cover is um, Power BI. And Power BI is just Power Business Intelligence. Um, it is a tool from Microsoft. If uh, I was under the impression it was free, somebody uh, corrected me. If you've got the full license of Microsoft Office um, or Office 365, then it is a free tool. If you're only using the online components of Microsoft 365 or Office 365, then it is a different charge, an additional charge. But if you're using the full version where you've got your desktop applications for Word, Excel, and Outlook, uh, then it's included in is my understanding. And Power BI just creates a, a project. And this is really an accessible way to get to your information. If you're a database person, you can do a lot of manipulations inside of Power BI. But if you're a C-level person or a manager person, you can come into Power BI and quickly get a report out that makes sense to you and be able to drill in to that information and see uh, things, answer your own questions. So it is an accessible tool. You don't have to know how to write queries and do all sorts of manipulations. It does make it easier here. One of the nice things is just like in focus, I can modify relationships. Um, so if I need to draw information in from both um, Salesforce and my Epicor data, I can create relationships if I need to, or even if I'm looking at tables inside of Epicor, uh, if I need to change the relationship or the Power BI doesn't automatically draw the relationship in, you can go and create those relationships so that you can query information. Very easy to create visualizations. I'll show you how to create one. Um, and the reports are then easy to publish out to what they call Power BI service, which is basically cloud. Um, so I can publish these inform this information out to the cloud, and then anybody that I give that URL to uh, can see that you can secure that information as well. So you have to perhaps have a login into the uh, Active Directory for the cloud for your company before you can get to that uh, report, or you can share it out publicly if you wanted to. And they do combine uh, or have a piece where you can actually manipulate the reports that you're doing so that you can change how they appear on a mobile device. So where you don't have as wide of a screen, you might wanna lay out your, your report a little bit differently so that it's accessible on a mobile device. Nice part about this, and Focus does this as well, even though I didn't drill on it, um, is I can interact with my visualizations so that as I work with a visualization, I can use that as a filter and that can affect my other visualizations. And I'll show you an example of doing that. Now, Power BI, um, one of the nice things, there's a ton of data sources that you can get. Um, there's even things that I would never have thought to get data from, like MailChimp, 
Um, you can actually pull data off of a web page if you want to. And in the tutorials for Power BI, one of their examples literally is taking data for sales, I believe it is, for sunglasses, and then corresponding that to weather on a web page, and then pulling that information together. So things that you wouldn't necessarily think of putting together with Power BI, you can actually relate this information together. So it's pretty cool. And of course, the biggie down here, OData. And with my with uh, Epicor REST, you can always get to the OData information inside of Epicor. You can get to your BAQs via OData. So anything in Epicor, although you can query SQL directly, you can also get to it through the OData layer. So very easy to get information. Um, this is showing an example of how you can draw relationships if you want to. Power BI does uh, try to find relationships between tables when you bring them in. So it will draw those automatically for you. But if you need to, you can, re you can create additional or replace what they've already got for a relationship. And it's as simple as drag uh, I think for this one, I drag or drug customer number from customers, dropped it onto order head. It found the, na the same name in the column and did the relationship for me. So very easy to manipulate the information and very easy to create a visualization like this. So what I'll do is I'll bring up my Power BI. There we go. So this is the tool you would use to actually work with your visualizations. One of the nice things with this is I can click on a visualization. So I clicked on New York. My grid of data down below filtered to just those items in New York. And then my count of orders also filtered to just New York, or it highlighted my New York field. If I click over to Minnesota, then I get that one. I can also control click and highlight multiple bars inside of one graph. And notice the map the uh, count of orders by state and my grid of information down here are all changing based on how I interact with one item. If I click off, I'm just going to click on the background of this grid. Everything shows. I can change to click into one of the other grids. And because they're all tied together, they're all zooming in and out and filtering the information for me automatically. So this is something you might, when you're looking at a BI tool, look for this interactivity because you don't want to be stuck with one thing, drilling into one item might show you information in another visualization. You want to have that capability to tie those things together so that you can see what's going on. Um, if you want to focus on Wisconsin, maybe it's important to see where in Wisconsin things are happening. Where, where are my customers located? Are they across the state? No, they're just in this one area. Okay, maybe I need to focus on how can I branch out beyond that one city or one county that I'm working in already? How can I do that? Nice thing here, um, I very quickly, I'd have to go look at how I did this again, but um, you can color code information uh, based on show me a dark number for the, for the largest value and then fade into the smallest value. And you can set that on any of these items. You can set it on multiple of those items. Even if I sort by a different item, so I clicked on sorting by order line, probably should have sorted by order number, that would have made more sense, that highlight still stays. So maybe I want to look at specifically order 5010. That's going to show me that was this much of Wisconsin. Over here, it'll show me where in there, and I've got this specific order highlighted. If I click off of that, everything zooms back out, um, and I've still got my color banding so I can quickly see a group of information. Now for building a visualization, um, I can come over here to my fields. These are the tables that I had imported in. Um, I can just drop in, let's say I want state, and I'm just gonna drop this onto the background here. And it's going to pick a visualization for me. Because it was state, it said, hey, you probably wanted a world map. And I can even expand this if I want to. So this makes it very easy to work with. Um, maybe I want, uh, for the, um, I lost my information here. I want my order head, uh, let's go for order detail. Cause I kind of wanted an extended price. Let's get some of order quantity probably would be a better one. We'll drop that onto my data fields. I could filter that by, you have to order, um, more than or less than a certain amount. If I don't want that on there anymore, I can just click it off. Um, you can, just like I did over here, based on the number 
of items. I'm going to click on this visualization. Notice my filters over here change so that I can work with just that one on the size. So the size of that circle is based on the count of customers. So if I've got more customers in that area, it's going to be a larger dot for me. So very easy to change your information as you're going through here. Um, if I wanted it instead, let's see if I could come over onto this map and I'm going to change my size based on um, some of order, uh, the sum of the discount, which I don't think I have any, but we'll give it a shot. There we go. I have one guy. So this was a big discount and these other guys were small discounts. So maybe I want to go, who's the sales rep in this area that's giving us large discounts? Maybe not the best example of what you could do with data. But then again, if you're wondering why your profit margin went really low in Minnesota, maybe that shows you exactly who you need to talk to because you need to talk to the sales rep in that area or what's happening. Why are we giving that discount there? Nice thing about uh, Power BI, I have tabs down here. So even when I publish this report, I can have multiple tabs with different bits of information. So I had state information on one. I've got orders by date on another. And even though I've got orders by date, uh, because I'm crossing multiple year or multiple states and years, you'll notice that it's changing this graph to indicate different information for those different months that we've got going on in that area. And I'm just using my mouse wheel to zoom in. And you'll see it's very easy to zoom in and still get the information that you want. I can drag my map over, all interactive. I'm going to flip back to my state information. To get this out to the web, since I'm getting close on time here, I'm going to save my changes. I'm going to publish it to my workspace. Now, I haven't looked at putting out multiple workspaces. My understanding is you can. So if you had multiple departments that you needed to work with, you can say, hey, uh, finance department has their own workspace, and I'm going to publish to that. And you can secure that workspace to just the finance department. So I can open this up. I'm just on the web page. What's nice about this, I'll expand this completely. So it grabbed my map over here. I can still click on states. I can control click on Wisconsin. It's going to add that in. Notice I've still got my interactivity with everything going on. I can still drag a map, drop it around. I can still do my sorting. Uh, order num. I got to remember not to sort on order line. There we go. And all my color coding is going with it. My orders by date. I can click on that tab over here and I still get that same interactivity that I've got. So it's a very nice tool. This is some, I'm not saying Power BI is the answer to the world. What I'm saying is these types of features are probably things you want to look at when you go to look for your, power, your BI solution, whether that be Focus, Power BI, Tableau, any of the others that are out there. Look for things that are going to have features that you want to use or that you will actually use, not want to, but you'll actually use. A lot of things have features that may not make sense. So do look at them in light of what is it I really want to do with my world here. Uh, let me jump back to my presentation, minimize this. Oops, got it. Go away, go away. Here we are. Um, obviously free with Office 365. Like I said, there are other add-ins to be able to do some things. Uh, for example, looking at your shop floor as an image is a capability. There are other business intelligence solutions out there. Tableau is another popular one. And then these others that are listed as well. And I'm kind of just jumping because I realized I'm getting close to the end of my time and I wanted to save time for questions. So a couple of tips, know what you're looking for. If you don't have a question of that you're trying to solve, then business intelligence isn't going to get you there. You need to understand what is it that you're looking for? What is this? What is the problem you're trying to solve? If you don't have a problem and you don't know what you're looking at, you're wasting money. Don't be afraid to play, especially with the Power BI tool. Um, it's how you learn. Play with the tools, figure out how they work, and then you're going to find different ways to visualize that data that makes sense to you. So that's a good thing. I'll have links for more information. I'll include that in the, the PowerPoint when I send it out to Christine. And we're up to questions. If anybody's got questions, I will take them. Everyone's quiet or typing massively. Or I put you all to sleep. <laughs> I don't see 
see anything in the chat yet. Okay. It's pretty quiet. I can make you laugh by going back to the Mad Hatter picture. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Everyone needs to smile. Come on. <laughs> I know we're practicing social distancing, but we don't have to practice social distancing in talking. <laughs> okay. Well, if there's no questions, I'll still be around the rest of the meeting. So if you do come up with other questions, um, feel free to Power put them in the window. Is, yeah, Power BI is very, it's where people are going down the road. Um, getting knowledge out of your system. You're putting all the data in. You got to find a way to get the data back out in a meaningful way. So there are a whole lot of options out there. And um, because it was going to be announced at Insights, um, Focus Software is working on. They have several pre-built dashboards for different areas of Epicor. Uh, they were announcing, I believe they were announcing, I'm not sure I'm supposed to tell you this, uh, they are coming out with or developing a set of dashboards that are also for financials. Um, so the power of that tool is also increasing, uh, meaning when you purchase it, you've got some things right out of the box that you might be able to use. If you're looking for what questions do I want to try and answer, maybe explore with Excel and Power BI because they're free find out things that you are looking for, things that you want to be able to do, and then go look for what is the right BI solution if it's not Power BI, if you need something that's more powerful um, or works in a different way for your situation. I also want to say Christine had mentioned um, they had like sales analysis, inventory movement. There was manufacturing analysis that was already in there. And... Uh, they were adding the entire financial cubes. The other thing I pegged her with, can people share what they build in Focus Software? And she said, yes. So if you build a great query that's usable or shareable, I'm going to see this also as a rug cup presentation in the future. Um, analyzing the data and finding ways to get more out of what you've been collecting in the Epicor system is going to be kind of key as we move forward. I see that definitely impacting us. And it was nice that you can share it with other users. So Scott was asking, well, I think what in respect to what Fred said, um, was that EDD or EDA? So Focus Software is EDA, Epicor Data Analytics. So that's the one that was going to get the financial pieces. Epicor Data Analytics. Okay, so EDD read? was the focus. EDA was the active nope, nope. homepage, you're, you're, the title. You're backwards, Calvin, you're backwards. Oh, got it. EDD is active homepage. That's from Epicor. EDA is from Focus Software. Focus. Did I read somewhere that one of them or some tool was going to have... Um, Improved financial reporting, like financial That's ED. statements. Yep, EDA is is adding in. Um, I I heard through the grapevine, so that I don't violate anything. Heard through the grapevine that that was going to be announced at Insights. Um, so I, I'm guessing it will be announced shortly via emails or something uh, that they're increasing that tool. I mean, I don't have any insights. I just know whatever I've been reading. So somewhere I. Must have heard that. Yeah. And Scott, you also asked, isn't EDD also built on Focus Platform? I thought it was as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we had Christine in for the uh, Illinois user group, she had corrected me that, no, there, there are two different uh, tool sets. But I had thought that EDD was also built on Focus, and that's why they look so similar. So one of us might be wrong. I'm not sure. But <laughs> that's the understanding I have right now. Well, Fred, thank you for your presentation. You bet. <laughs>
lots of good information in it. Um, does anybody have any other questions for Fred or any other general questions? If everyone wants to do like a five-minute bio break or whatever, we'll get together again at 1140. Uh, Source Day is now on the meeting with us. I'll go ahead and pass over the presentership over to Clint and Philip. They're going to be uh, letting us know how to stop missing things uh, in the sourcing channel. And I can go ahead and make Clint the presenter right now. and We can get your uh, screen ready, Clint. Sounds good. Awesome. Um, t -t -t there you are. And we can all get together back at 1140. And Sounds if you good. want to share your screen there, Clint, you've got the... Yeah, uh, just give me a... Just give me a second here. I got a pop up. As soon as I went to share it, I got a pop up saying I had to give permission. So, give me a second here. All right. So, it's going to make me uh, quit go to meeting. We switched over to Zoom, so I guess it's taken over. So, let me uh, let me just try this. One second. Um, Yeah, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to leave the meeting and come right back. It looks like. Okay. All right, that hopefully worked. Um, yep. Got it. And if we could also go ahead and make Philip Velka a presenter as well. Um, can't do a dual presenter at the same time. Just let me know. I'll go ahead and transfer over to Philip when you're ready. Great. Sounds good. There can only be one at a time. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Before I eat crow, yeah, I verified. I can only make him the presenter. I can't do a shared one with you. So I've got him queued up when you're ready. We'll all get back together at 1140. Sounds good. 